In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to use the clock in MIT App Inventor 2 through a stopwatch tutorial. You can see here I just started the stopwatch and then I can stop it and reset and go again. Let's put those start, stop, and reset buttons in a table arrangement so that they can be side by side. I'm going to go to layout and then choose table arrangement. The default is to have two rows and two columns, but we actually want three columns and one row. So I'm going to change this to columns to three and rows to one. You can see that it got a little shorter and fatter. Now we want to put those three buttons in there. So I'll go to user interface and drag in three buttons. And now I want to change the text on those. So button three will be the reset button. Button two will be the stop button. And button one will be the start button. I'm also going to rename each of these buttons so that once we get into the code, it will be easy to tell which one we're looking at. So I'm just going to click on each of these and rename them. Lastly, we need a label that will actually show the time that has elapsed. So I'll just get a label and drag it up to the top. We also need to change the text on label 1 to, from text for label 1 to show all zeros because when the screen first initializes, no time has yet elapsed. I'm going to do four pairs of zeros to represent hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. I'll separate the first three with colons and the last with a period. Going back to the buttons, we're going to need to disable both stop and reset. That's because when the screen first initializes, the only thing the user should be able to do is to start the stopwatch. It's not meaningful to stop or reset it if it hasn't already started. So let's go to reset and stop and uncheck the enable button. Now we'll need to add a clock sensor as well. The clock is what we're going to be using to update the time. Let's go to sensors and drag the clock over. The way this works is it's not going to be able to automatically update the time on here. We have to tell it to update it periodically, and that's what we can do using the timer. The timer will fire as often as we set it to in timer interval, and then each time it fires, we'll update what it shows on here. We want it to start off as not enabled because we don't want the timer to start if they haven't clicked the start button. I'm also going to change the timer interval. This is measured in milliseconds, so it's currently at one second, which is a bit too long. So I'm going to change it to 10, which will make it fire more frequently. All right, now on to the code. To update the time in our time label, we're going to need to compare the current time to what time it was when the user clicks the start button. To remember what time it was when they click the start button, we'll want to store that in a variable. So let's create a global variable by going under variables and choosing initialize global. I'm going to call this start time. And the, the initial value for this isn't really meaningful because we only really care about the value once they click the start button. So I'm just going to start off at zero. Now let's code what we're going to do when they click the start button. I'll go to start and choose when start.click. So when they click the start button, First of all, we want to enable our timer on our clock, and that's going to set the ball rolling so that we'll be updating the time that shows on the screen. So I'm going to go to clock one and scroll down to where it says set clock one dot timer enabled to, and we want to make that true to enable it. So I'll go to logic and choose true. So now we have this timer that's going to be firing every 10 milliseconds. Next, we need to set this time variable because we've clicked the start button. So we need to capture the time that is now to reference that later. So I'm going to mouse over this and get set global start time to. And we want to set that to the current time. And that's going to be something we can get in clock. So I'll click on clock one and then scroll down to clock one dot now, which gets the current time. So let's pull that down. Now we, what we also need to do is to disable the start button because now that we've clicked it once, we want to make sure they can't click the start button again. They'll have to stop it and reset it first. So to disable that, we're going to go to start and then go to where it says start.enabled start and we want to make that false to disable it. We also now want to enable button 2 so that it's now possible to stop it. I'm just going to copy and paste this and change it from start to stop, and then we want to make this true. All right, so let's figure out what to do if they click the stop button. Let's go to stop and get that block when stop.click. We want to now disable the timer because we no longer want to update the time that's showing on the screen because we've stopped it. So I'm just going to copy and paste this and change it to false. 
Now we want to enable our reset button now that we've stopped it. So I'm going to take this one and change it to reset and that's going to be enabled. And now we want to disable the stop button because it's meaningless to try to stop the timer again. So I will change this to false. And lastly, our reset button. So let's get that one. When reset.click. We want to update the time on the screen to now show zeros. So let's change the text in the label by going to label one and choosing set label one dot text two. And this is just going to be zeros. So I'll go to text, choose this one, and make it double zeros. Now we'll want to enable our start button now that we've reset. So I'm going to get this one and change it from false to true. And then we'll want to disable our reset button. So I will take this one and make it disabled. So make that false. Okay, so now we need to figure out what to do with this timer that we've started up here once we click the start button. To figure that out, we're going to go to clock and choose this one which says when clock one dot timer. And this is going to occur whenever the timer fires, which I said to be 10 milliseconds. So every 10 milliseconds, we want to update the time that's displayed on the screen. Let's get this one. We're going to need to have this variable called duration, which will be the difference between the time that it is now and the time that it was when we first started our stopwatch. We aren't going to use that anywhere else, so we can make that a local variable. I'm going to go to variables and choose initialize local name too, and I'm going to call it duration. With the clock, there are a lot of built-in functions that can do what we want for us, and that's going to be true in this case as well. There's a function called duration, which takes a start and end time and finds the time, the distance between them. So we're going to want to use that. Our start time is going to be that start time variable that we have up here. So I'm going to mouse over that and choose get start time. And then our end time is the current time. So we can go to clock one and scroll down to where it says clock one dot now. So what are we going to do with this duration variable? Well, this is what we're going to use to update what our label shows. So let's set that labels text by clicking on label one and choosing set label one dot text two. We're going to need to join quite a few things here. We'll need to first have the hours that have passed, then a colon, then the minutes that have passed, then another colon, then the seconds that have passed, and then a period, and then the milliseconds that have passed. So that's going to be seven things. And we'll need to join those seven pieces of text with the join function under text. So let's get that. It's right here. And then you'll need to change this so that it has seven spots. I'm gonna click on this and drag five more over. Now before we go on here with adding our hours, minutes, and seconds, we're going to need to create an outside procedure to add a zero onto the minutes and seconds because the way our code is going to work, automatically if one of our values is one digit, it's not going to add that extra zero in front. And that's not the way we like to format things because, for example, if three minutes have passed, we actually want it to display zero three and not just three. And that's just so that the formatting is consistent so that once we go from nine minutes to 10 minutes, it's not going to get a little bit wider. This will just make it more consistent. So let's define our own procedure to take care of that for us. I'm going to scroll up here and then get a new procedure. And you want to get the second one, which says to procedure result. This allows us to return something from this procedure that we can use elsewhere. So I'm going to get this. We also want to change it so that it has an input. An input is something that we pass into it that I will use. So I'm going to click on this and drag an input over. This input will represent either the hours, minutes, or seconds values that we're feeding in. Now what we want to do is to check to see if this is one digit long. And if it is, then we just add a zero on the beginning. So to check to see if it's one digit long, let's get an if statement from control. Note that instead of getting the one that we usually do like this, we're going to get this one down here. This is important because it has this puzzle piece on the side instead of the top and bottom, which allows it to fit into this particular procedure block. So let's get that. First of all, we need to define the condition. The condition is if the length of this is one. So let's go to math to check for equality and get the equals. To get the length of our x input, uh, we can just use a text one. So if we go to text and choose length, then we need to tell it what we're getting the length of, and that's just x. And we want to see if the length is one. So I'll go to math and make this one. If the length is one, then we want to add a zero to it. So we're going to need to join a zero with x. So let's get that join. 
first is our zero, so I'll go to text and choose this one and just make it a zero. And then the second thing is x. Else, or otherwise, so if our length isn't one, then we just want to return x itself because we don't need to change it at all. All right, with that defined, let's go back to our timer. So first of all, we want to have the hours. But before we just feed in the hours, we're going to need to put it through this procedure that we just created. So let's go to procedures and choose call procedure. And we need to figure out what is this x that we're passing in. Well, this is going to be another handy function that we can that's already defined for clock one. So if you go to clock one, you'll see that there's a function called duration to hours. And it just takes a duration and spits out the hours. That's where we have this um, duration variable that's going to come in handy. So let's pull that down. And then for our duration, that's just this variable duration up here. Next, we need a colon. So I'll go to text, get this one, and make it a colon. And I'm actually just going to copy and paste this because we'll want another one between the minutes and seconds. And I'll do one more um, for between the seconds and the milliseconds, but change it to a period. For the formatting of the minutes, it's going to be very similar. Again, we're going to want to call this procedure, so I'll go to Procedures and choose this. Here we're going to use the Duration to Minutes function, which is similar to Duration to Hours. So let's go here and scroll down to Duration to Minutes, and then our duration is going to be Get Duration. However, we can't just use this by itself, and that's because it doesn't know to stop at 60. So it will actually keep going past 60 to 61, 62, etc., which is obviously not what we want. We want it to go back to zero once it gets to 60. In order to do that, we're going to have to use what's called the modulo function. Modulo takes the remainder when a certain number is divided by another number. For example, 13 mod 5 is 3 because we have 15 times 2 makes 10, and then we have that remainder of 3, which is 13 minus 10. Here we can take the modulo by 60 because we want the remainder when it's divided by 60. For example, if only 33 seconds have passed, then 33 mod 60 is just going to be 33 because the quotient is 0 and the remainder is 33. If, however, we are now at 64 seconds, so a minute and 4 seconds have passed, then 64 mod 60 is going to be 4 because the remainder when you divide 64 by 60 is 4. So to get modulo, we're going to go under math and choose modulo of. It takes two things. The first thing is the one we're dividing into. So that's just this one. And then the second one is the one we're dividing by, and that's 60. So let's go to math and do this one and change it to 60. It's going to be a very similar thing for seconds. I'm actually just going to copy and paste this, but take out duration to minutes and then instead use duration to seconds. So that's again under here and duration to seconds. And I'm just going to pull this duration one up here and get rid of this. Milliseconds is actually going to be even simpler. We don't need to call our procedure this time because the milliseconds are three digits long and so we, it doesn't really make sense to put a zero in front of them and also they're just moving so fast that it doesn't really matter. There's also not a durations to milliseconds function so we can do that ourselves by just using this modulo function again but instead of doing it by 60 We'll do it by 1,000 because we just want those last three digits. So let's get modulo. And what we're dividing into is just duration by itself. I'm just going to copy and paste this. And then we want a number. So I'm going to copy and paste the 60 and bring it over and just change it to 1,000. And that's it. Go ahead and test this out on an Android device. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe.